Hi, thank you for tuning in. This is the webcast, Using Census Data to Tell Your Story. Today we're going to be talking with Alexandra Barker. She's from the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, she is the Data Dissemination and Media Relations Specialist. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in today. So before we get started, I just have a few notes so that you can maximize your time here. So we are taking questions. This is a live webcast uh, on Friday, February, uh, January 23rd. Right? <laughs> and so our number here is, you can see on your screen, 862-3966. Please call in at any time. Don't wait. If you've got a question, call in. Alexander's happy to take your calls. Um, next, this is a two-hour presentation, so we want you to get comfortable. Make sure you minimize your distractions. If you've got headphones, you know, turn off Facebook. Um, we are going to be breaking this up into three different parts, and so we'll have stretch breaks in between each part uh, so that you can uh, get comfortable again and readjust yourself. Um, you can follow along um, on the materials that I sent out this morning, which are also available, will be available online on this re recorded video um, after the, the presentation. Um, and again, if you have questions or um, any concerns, please feel free to call us, 862-3966, um, and then we'll just jump right in. Yes. Okay, so our first part today, we're going to be talking about the overview of geographies, programs, and data sets available. Correct. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Alexandra. Good. So they have, you um, can see my screen right now, right? Um, yeah, so you're on your presentation. Yeah. There we are. Sounds good. Okay. So first of all, this is my contact information. If anyone... Um, would like to ask me a question, they have a data inquiry, would like to request um, a workshop for your organization, webinar, I am available. This is a free service of the Census Bureau. So anytime you have data questions, please reach out to me. I'm your local resource from the Census Bureau. And so keep uh, take note of my contact information. That's uh, something, to, so if you're gonna keep something to, from today, my contact information is what you wanna keep. Um, so again, as uh, Sheila mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking right now in part one about uh, what are the elements that are important for you to know and become familiar with uh, in order to access census data successfully for any grant or any planning or any project you have. Uh, this is the most technical part of this presentation, then we're going to have some fun when we go online in part two and three and really access data for your areas, but we just really need to go over these elements in order to um, work online later on. So um, part two is when we're going to have the first online activity. Uh, we're going to access data profiles. There, uh, I, I find them to be the easiest um, uh, way to access census data, and you can get good summaries of your area. Uh, so I'm teaching you how to, I will teach you how to access those data profiles and map some of the information. And then we're going to go into part three, and we're going to look at the teal tables. So if you are looking for, let's say, poverty data, and in the profiles you're able to find some information about poverty, we can now look at detailed tables and find a lot more about poverty for your area. And this is true with any of the variables available in our system. You can find them in a profile and you can find them as a detail table. So the, the part, part three, we're going to be looking at those detail tables. Um, so moving on to the presentation. All right, so our first part here, we're going to be just doing understanding where the data comes from. Yes. We're going to be trying to understand what it looks like on the broader scale, but this is a bit more technical, so everyone needs to put on their, their data hat for, exactly. for the next half an hour. Yes. And then the next part two and part three, we get to kind of dig in and play around with yes. the data a little bit more. The good thing is uh, you, you sent to everyone this PowerPoint, and this is a good resource to have. After you go online and you're on your own, you'll be able to refer to it and play with the tool again on your own. Fantastic. Okay. So moving on in the presentation, um, I just want to talk a little bit about what the Census Bureau is doing um, right now. Uh, most people know that we are um, out every 10 years, so they expect to see us out every 10 years to conduct the census. However, we are out every month of every year collecting data from communities across the country. Uh, from every city and town, and even we have data below level, city and town level. Uh, we have a variety of surveys. Um, some of them are sponsored by other federal agencies, uh, some are our own surveys. We'll be talking about one of our surveys today, the American Community Survey. But on the screen right now, if you can look at the slide, it's about the current population survey, which is sponsored by uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And it's a very important piece of statistics that comes out of that survey, which is the unemployment rate. So we always hear in the news, first week of the month, about unemployment. Um, and I know it's a piece of statistics that people are interested most times. And yes, it's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but what people don't know is we are behind that collecting the data on their behalf. Uh, so this is what we do. We are 
actually sponsored by several federal agencies to collect data on their behalf. Um, so we have our um, field representatives uh, knocking on doors. Um, so y if you uh, get selected by a for a survey, uh, make sure uh, you participate because we are out there. Um, so moving to the next slide, uh, we're going to be looking at one particular tool today, which is the American Fact Finder. Uh, we have some quick ways of accessing that on our website. However, um, with the geography in Vermont and you have so many small towns, um, I find American Fact Finder to be the easiest and most friendly way for you to access data. Uh, some of these quick tools are not helpful when it comes to townships, and you do have a lot of towns here. Uh, that's why we're going to look at American Fact Finder today. Um, Looks like we have a call. Oh, good. Okay. Let's see what we have. All right. Hello. Are you there? Do you have a call? Oh, did I hang up on him? I'm sorry. <laughs> Have I hung up on you? <laughs> Please call back. <laughs> All right, we'll continue. Hopefully, okay. we'll call back. Yes, I'll wait for that call. Okay, so moving uh, on, on the presentation. Um, when you are in our ex using our data tools, and this is not just true about the American Fact Finder, but also from any data tool, uh, to know these elements that you see on screen. Right now, the geographies, the programs, the data sets, and the variables are key. Know what's available. It saves you so much time um, in the system. So right now, I'm going to review with you each one of these elements. That way, you're familiar with them when we go online. So we're going to start with geography. So those are the four areas of technical topics that we're really going to cover and dig into today. Yes. You get right. nothing else out of this yes. first presentation. OK, fantastic. Yeah. So we have summary levels, program, data sets, and topics and variables. Correct. OK. I'm going to go into detail each one of them, okay. especially the top three, summary levels levels, uh, programs, and data sets. Um, they're really important to, for you to become familiar with them in order to access data. So um, looking at the screen right now, we're going to look at geography. This is a screenshot of American Fact Finder advanced search. Um, as you can see right here, I highlighted in yellow advanced search is where I am in the system. It's where you're going to learn to, it's what you're going to learn to use today. Um, geography is you can select your geography right here under search options. And you get a pop-up window with four different ways of selecting geography. We're going to spend most of our time looking for geography from list. Um, and if we have an opportunity during part three, we're going to also use address and mapping. But let's stay with list um, for now and for um, part two for sure. Uh, before we go online, it's important to know what geographies you can get data for. Uh, and we do publish data for several levels of geography, depending on what program that is coming from. But the, what you see on your screen right now are just the most popular geographies you can access data for. And some of these geographies you're familiar with, you learn in school, we know all of them. And some are census geography. This is what I want to go over with you. So if you look at this chart and you want to access data by zip code, um, I would say majority of people would go right away and select the geography to be called zip codes. Mm -hmm. And in our system, you need to tell American Fact Finder, what is the level of geography that you want to get data for? We call geographic type. And if you say, I want to get data for zip codes, this geography is only available for business data that are related to businesses. You won't mm -hmm. find that related to people, such as poverty, housing, and all of that. So our census geography for zip code, oh, let me get my mouse I'm going crazy on the screen, OK? It's called zip code tabulation area. So if, you're doing, if you want to find data for zip code areas, this is what you need to remember at least data about people. You need to find data for zip code tabulation areas. Below that, we have data uh, for regions, divisions, and states. Let's stop a little bit with states and see what are the divisions of uh, the state level data. So you can get data for the state of Vermont, but you can also get data for school districts, congressional districts, state legislative districts. And you see some other geographies right there we won't cover today. And, and economic places is also the geography you need uh, to access data for cities and towns from economic programs, not related to people, but related to businesses. Number of businesses, what kind of businesses, uh, number of employees, and receipts, and all of that. So we call cities and towns for economic programs economic places. Uh, again, we can't make it too easy and just say cities and towns, right? We need to give uh, <laughs> names like economic places and all that. It, well, it gets worse than that. <laughs> well, if you want to access data for cities and towns, um, there are two um, um, terminologies we use to refer to cities and towns. You won't see city and town on this chart right now, it's this graph. Um, first one I want to point out, if I can see my mouse, it's right here. Uh, it's places. Places are divisions of states, and any city and town outside New England would be a place. 
Uh, so when you access census data for cities and towns outside New England, we call them places. If you're accessing data for villages, and I know you have some villages in the state of Vermont, you also find your villages under places. So this is important to know about places, especially here about villages. You would find them under place geography. That's how we call your villages. However, if you want to see data for all cities and towns in the state, cities and towns in New England states are divisions of counties. So we call them county subdivisions. This is the name you really need to remember. If you're accessing data for your city and town, you won't find city and town on the, on the system. You'll find the name the county subdivision. And this is where you want to go to find your city and town an exact boundary you would expect. On the places you may not find that. What you find, let's say for Burlington, uh, or for let's say a town around, you'd find the name of the town followed by acronym says CDP, which stands for Census Designated Place. And if you don't know what that is, just don't use it. <laughs> it could be a different boundary from what you expect, because it's a designated place by the Census Bureau. So you want to really go with the county subdivision. That's the safe way to find that for your city and town. And if you need to look at an area below the city and town level, you could do that. I am aware that in Vermont you have really small towns with a um, small population. But let's think of Burlington or even in the county level. Um, you, if you want to look at parts of these areas, we do have three census geographies. They're called tracks, block groups, and blocks. And if you see back on this, the presentation, they are highlighted. Um, the last three geographies, and they are divisions of counties. So what is a track? So you can imagine a county to be a, on a map of a county, uh, the county where we are right now, uh, and split that in large uh, puzzle pieces. And each piece of this large puzzle would be um, a track. So we can look at data for that part. So Burlington, I believe, is like seven tracks form Burlington. So if you don't want a data just for the entire city, you want to look, let's say, single moms unemployed for Burlington. You can have the data for the entire city, but you want to, you want, you want to see what areas within the city have more single moms unemployed. You could look at that by track. Um, track would be helpful for cities like Burlington and some larger areas, but when we go to small towns, it could be complicated. Like, you may have towns here that are on one track, so it makes no sense to look at track level. Or you may have towns here that are below, they're smaller than a, what a track is. Uh, and we also have two other geographies that are smaller than a track if you need to really go more into a neighborhood or a street level, which are called block groups and blocks. So looking at that puzzle where you had really large pieces, like really like three years old, like playing a puzzle with really large pieces, and you split that in other smaller parts, we call that the block groups. So putting some block groups together, you form a track. Um, so you can find data and you can still find good demographic and socioeconomic data for the block group level. And I will show you in a little bit on the presentation what they look like. And the next level will be block. And in some areas it could be just a, a block, like a city block. But I'm showing areas here, like a small towns, it could be miles and miles um, of land and may have no population on a block. So let me show you on screen right now what a track looks like. Um, so a track, again, it's they all number. And if you would go for a track in Burlington, you would find on a map pieces of um, Burlington on um, but it'll be formed by pieces of like tracks. Um, and do those match up with anything like we have wards in Burlington? No, they don't so follow any political boundaries. Okay. They are really um, um, census geography. Mm -hmm. We do follow physical boundaries to design the tracks. And they have a threshold in population, which is no more than 8,000 people, no less than 1,500. So you can see if you have a town with less than 1,500, it would be smaller even in a track. Uh, but Burlington, used, we have about a little bit over 40,000 people. It's like 42,000 people in Burlington, so you have a few tracks in Burlington. Um, so you could examine Burlington by neighborhood level, let's put it that way. Let's call a track neighborhood. I know it's a more familiar language. Um, and anything below that, it's a little bit uh, difficult to access data, I would say, for Vermont. I would not go, let me show you anyway what a block group looks like. It's a part of that track. And then you have a block, which is a part of that block group. Uh, it's the smallest level of geography. So with uh, Vermont, I would stay with state level, county level, cities and towns, like the county subdivisions. And if you need, in areas like Burlington or um, if, yes, larger. Montpelier. Yes, Montpelier has about 8,000 people, or a little bit more. So you probably want track. Mm -hmm. um, you may want to look at track level. Or even there's something you can do with tracks, too. Let's say we have the lake here. in. Um, it's a beautiful lake, by the way, but you have this lake, and you, you don't want to look at just one particular city bordering the lake, even if it's across the state, because I think upstate New York also border the lake, sure, right? Yeah. And you want, there's, say, pollution in the lake. Hope, hopefully not. It's a beautiful <laughs> lake, but if uh, you want to look at all families living just bordering the lake, 
you can look at the tracks around the lake. You will look at Vermont tracks and New York tracks, and you can assess how many families will be impacted by anything happening in that lake. Yeah, so tracks are useful for that as well. And hopefully we have time to cover that in part three when we talk about geoblurbs. So if there's an environmental group doing watershed information, tracks might be a useful way to exactly. track a watershed. Yes, you could do that. And even if you have, like, you want to look um, along a river uh, bank, um, all the little areas, you can look at tracks just bordering the river. There's a few things you can do with tracks that are still helpful. Mm, interesting. Um, so moving on to the presentation, let's just go over the next element right now. If you have any questions about geographies, uh, please call us uh, so I can answer your questions about yeah. geographies. And again, that number is 862-3966. Yes. Um, and again, when I go online, I will go over geography again. But um, about programs, you see on your screen right now, if I um, can just show you on the screen. Again, I'm back on, with a screenshot of American Fact Finder and Advanced Search. And we looked first at a search option called geographies, but right above it we have topics. Topics is where you find the other three elements. You would find your programs, you also would find your data sets, and your variables. Right now we're looking at programs, so if I, when I expand program from this pop-up window, you get a list of um, census and surveys you can get data from. Um, depending on the level of geography you have, if it's a city and town, you won't have this full list. You have just the programs that are available for city and town level. In this case, it would be the American Community Survey, and you would have, depending on the area, you could have an economic census, but you're going to have a decennial census for sure. Um, reviewing our programs right now, um, first is the decennial census, and um, is what we are known for. The purpose of a census is reapportionment and redistricting. Um, there's just so much information we need to get that job done. And this is why we had a short form in this previous census, just to collect the basic demographics. And if you received a handout today from Sheila, and I believe you did, it's a yellow and blue handout. The yellow part will show you what are the variables we are collecting, but I can just uh, reach you right now if you can see the handout, if you don't have it in front of you. Uh, from a census, we collect age, race, sex, Hispanic or Latino origin, household relationship, tenure, whether you own or rent your home, and vacancy characteristics. This is all we get from the decennial census. Uh, and this is the data you need to restrict and reapportion. Um, before 2010 census, so let's say 2000 and prior, we took the opportunity, we were out there already collecting data from every housing unit in the country, from every household, to also ask a few more questions. Um, so we did send a short form to get the basic demographic information from every housing unit and we call that 100% data, it's a count. But we also, we were there, let's ask a few more questions and really get the information that's very important for a lot of organizations. You know, the income, the poverty, the education, disability, health insurance, all that good stuff. So we sent a uh, long form to a sample. About one in every six households in 2000 got that um, form. And we collect really good information, again, in that, um, uh, one of the handouts you received, it will be in the blue area of the handout. Um, all the socioeconomic information we collected in 2000 from the long form. So when we got, we published the results from that long form, I would say most organizations were super happy to see all that rich data about their communities in a very small level of geography, cities and towns, down to block levels. All this great information being published. However, if you look at how the country has changed between 2000 and 2010, Having that data released once every 10 years, it's not, it's not enough. Like, we change every year. Our populations are constantly changing. And if you're writing a grant in 2005 with data from 2000, it may just feel too old for you to refer to your community based on income from 2000 when you are in 2005. So what the Census Bureau did is, uh, after 2000, went to Congress and got approved to get a long form and give it a new name, new look, retest the questions, and call it the American Community Survey. So a lot of the census that you see out there, the really rich data, is from this program. It can't, we still see it being missourced as just census data or people confusing with the decennial census, but the socioeconomic information is now collected on the American, by the American Community Survey. And that is part of the decennial program, as it used to be the long form, but this is the survey where you're gonna get all the rich data. You're gonna still get the demographic information collected on the census, but you're also gonna get the socioeconomic um, um, information. The beauty of the ACS is now you can see trends because the data is being collected every month of every year from a sample of about 3.5 million households in the country. So it's a real large sample. That way you can generate data for small geographies like tracks and cities and towns. Um, and you'll be able to look at this data over time. So 
So that's the beauty of it. So you don't have to go just every 10 years anymore. Uh, if you have any questions about programs, please um, just send your question. Uh, you can see on the screen I, right now, if you look at the PowerPoint, there are the two programs I made reference right there. One is the population estimate, the other one is the economic census. Won't really go into those today. Um, but if, you have, uh, if you're interested, please um, send me an email. I'll be glad to um, explain to you a little bit about those surveys and how to access data. But today we, we are going to stay with the senior census and the ACS, and we're going to see a lot of really cool and nice data from the American Community Survey. Um, moving on into data sets, um, well, before that, let me just review this uh, slide with you. Again, it's just a basic difference between the census and the ACS. Um, 2010 census, 100% data, it's a count of the population, the reference data they prefer. So if you're using census data, it's a picture of what the population of the country looked like on April 1st, 2010. Um, if you look at ACS data, it's sample data, the old long form in 2000, and it's about the characteristics of the communities and the trends. Um, and we do have it in periods, it's not like one picture of one day like the census. We publish data based on one year, three years, and five year estimates. And I'm going to go over that right now when we look at data sets. So let me move into the data set portion of um, this PowerPoint. And we, I think this is going to be sh a little bit shorter than half an hour, so I'm sure you all be happy it's not going to take too long. <laughs> uh, but please send your questions um, for me. So data sets right now on this um, screenshot. Again, you're going to select it from topics. The same way earlier we saw that you could expand program from here and select a program, such as the census or the ACS. You can also select your data sets. But as you can see in this list, is if you're not familiar with our data sets, this really doesn't mean anything to you. What's like a 2011 ACS five-year estimate? It's hard to tell what's in there. But um, our data sets are like folders inside a file cabinet. It's how we arrange and organize the data. And of course, if you know which folder to grab your information from, it's much easier, save your time. So understanding the data sets will save you a lot of time. And we'll go over data sets um, from the census and the ECS right now. So moving on with the presentation, the, this slide that you're seeing, looking at right now is about the data sets with the census. And I'm showing 2010 and 2000 census. So if you're looking at um, for census tables, we store them in primarily two data sets, Summer Files 1 and Summer Files 2. You see the restricting data set is by law we have to put that out for restricting and reapportionment. If you're interested in taking a look at what's available, what tables are available from, from that data set, just select it and you'll be able to see what tables are available for Vermont in that data set. Demographic profiles, that's our part two. We're going to look at all of these really cool profiles. But Summer file 1 and 2 on this, um, on this presentation you're looking at right now, uh, is where you're going to find most of the tables available from the decennial census. Summer file one, if you select that data set, you'll find tables that um, uh, have uh, the variables age, race, sex, Hispanic or Latino origin, household relationship, tenure, and vacancy. It could be just a table about race, or it could be crossed with other variables like age and sex. This is what you'll find on Summer File Ones. If you want to study um, the Hispanic population, you would find that about Hispanic population there, about the Asian population. It would be all there. The only time you really need to move to Summer File 2 to look for tables is when you want to see the same variables available on Summer File 1 for what we call detailed race or ethnic groups. So what's the difference? Well, the major race and ethnic groups um, so the race, uh, you have white, you have black and African Americans, you have Asians, and a few others, but we're going to stay with these three. I believe they are uh, what well, we're going to be looking at data more often here. Um, you have information about them in Summer File 1. You have information about ethnicity, about Hispanic in Summer File 1. If you want to look at detailed groups within these categories, let's say with Asian, you want to find out about the Korean population, the Cambodian population, you would go to Summer File 2 to find those. Within the Hispanic population, if now you don't want to just the Hispanic as a whole group, you want to look at Dominicans, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, you would go to Summer File 2 to find those. So in the handout, you receive the blue and yellow right in the back of the handout, you would have a list of detailed race and ethnic groups. That way you know when you need to go to Summer, uh, summer File 2 for those uh, information. I love that description that you had with the, with the filing cabinet. It really is helpful to know which file to grab yeah. and how to get in there. I feel like if at the beginning, when you're first starting out, you don't know what files you have. You almost just need to kind of put caution to the wind and dive right in and, and just see what's available for Vermont on, on uh, some of these. Yes and no. If, again, this handout is a good reference. Um, and let me 
going back to the file cabinet, uh, if you imagine two big file cabinets, one is the census, the other one is the ACS. Each drawer in that file cabinet would be a year. So the census would be 2010, 2000, 1990, or in the future 2020. <laughs> um, so each drawer is one year of the census, which is every 10 years. The ACS drawers would be different. They are available every year. So it would have 2013, which is the most current. 12, 11, down to 2005 is when we started the survey. So ACS data is 2005 and every year following. When you open, let's say, uh, the census 2010 drawer, you're going to have files. And you're going to have the summer file one, summer file two. And you know now in the summer file one, you're going to get all the variables, the demographics, summer file two, the same variables, but for detailed race groups. So you're going to have basically to work with those two files. When you go to an ACS drawer, it's a little bit different because you have every year. So let's say you open the 2013, and you're going to see in every year you're going to have three folders in the file. And those folders will be one year, three years, and five years. And I'm going to go into detail that right now. So knowing what you find in a one-year folder, three-years folder, or five-year folder is important. So if you want to look at ACS 2013 data, do I know if I should choose a one-year, a three-year, or five years? How do I choose that? That's what I want to review with you right now. Because I believe this will be the most important part of this <laughs> technical presentation right now. So moving on into the American Community Survey on the screen. The ACS is divided in four topics. Um, as you can see, it's social topic, demographic, economic, and housing. These are some of the, the variables available for you, um, and you'll be able to see them on the website as well when we go online. Um, for each of these topics, we have a data profile. We call them the DP tables. Um, and uh, part two is what we're going to see. So we're going to access the DP. It's called DP02, so data profile two for uh, social characteristics. DP03, the data profile three for the economic characteristics. DP04, available for the housing characteristics. And then DP05 for demographic characteristics. These um, four profiles are available in every ACS drawer. Every year they're available, and they're available in every folder, the one year, the three years, and five year folder. And we're going to go look at these folders right now. If we, okay? So, and again, the language, the census language for folders will be data sets. That's how we call them. So when we make reference to data sets, no, we're talking about those folders in the file cabinet. So with ACS, as you can see in my uh, presentation right now, uh, we, we release data based on a one-year estimate, three years estimate, and five-year estimate. When we first released ACS data, it was based on the 2005 questionnaires we collected. So we spent the entire year of 2005 collecting questionnaire from a sample, questionnaires from a sample. And after 12 months, we released data. The statisticians look at the data we collected and said, this is a good sample. It's enough data to release information for areas with 65,000 plus people a universe that's, that has more than 65,000 people. In your case in Vermont, you would get it for the state level. You may get it for one county or a few more counties. But for cities and towns, it would be really hard. You know, even Burlington is that big, right? Um, so when you estimate, I would say state level is fine. But um, it's not going to be useful for you if you're looking below state. So every, um, every year in the ACS, the 2013, 2012, all of them will have what we call the one-year estimate. Every table available from the ACS will be there under the one-year estimate. Uh, so if you want to look at um, education attainment um, and poverty and income for Vermont, you'll find that for every year you see here on the screen from 13, 2005, 2005 through 13, you would find that for the state of Vermont from a one-year estimate. But you still say looking at data for the county level, and you want to look at data for also the town level. So how do you go about it? Well, the one-year estimate folder or the data set, it's not going to be good enough for you. If you try to pull a table from that folder, from that data set, you'll be blank. Most likely you'll get a blank table because your county or your city may not qualify for that year estimate. So the three years estimate is the next one we have. It's for areas of 20,000 people or more. So Burlington would get a three years estimate. So if you go into the folder three years estimate or the data set, and you'd start to get a table about uh, disability, it will be available for the state of Vermont, has more than 20,000 people. It will be available for the county where we are. Um, it will be available for Burlington because they all have more than 20,000 people. However, for a few cities and towns, it won't be available. So you'll get a blank table. They won't be on that table. The three years estimate, um, as you can see on the screen, um, it, the reference it is exactly the three years we collect the data. So when you're using that, uh, make sure you always disclaim that. Um, so if you're using poverty data between 2011 and 13, you can say these are, these are the, in, the income, uh, people, people's income below poverty level between 11 and 13. 
you have to make reference to that period so people know it's a three years estimate. Um, every October, we release three years estimate. Every September, we release one year estimate. So your community will be getting new data every year. And now we go down to a five year estimate. And generally for Vermont, based on the, the work I have done here with other organizations, that's the folder you'll be going on for most times. So you really don't have to worry about the other two unless you're just doing state uh, level work. Um, Five-year estimates available for every geography from national level, state level, down to the track uh, and block group level. Um, Five-year estimates, the first release we had was 2005 and 2009, and they're released every December. So if you are working with the city of Burlington and you want to get a data profile for 13, we release it in, in December. Next December, we're going to release the 14. So every year in December, you're going to get new data for your community. So if you're doing a study on uh, health insurance, private and public for your town, know that every December new data will come out. Just a few uh, words and caution when you're using our data sets with the ACS. So if you're using a five-year estimate um, for your town and you want to compare to the state, do not compare a state-level one-year estimate table with a five-year estimate table for your town. It's not the same sample. You're talking about two different samples. Bring the state level to the common denominator, the five-year estimate. So make sure you have Vermont and your town under the five-year table. Only use the five-year folder. That way you're talking about the same sample. They become comparable. Oh, that's really interesting yeah. information, especially if you're comparing um, the county maybe to a town yes. or uh, the region to the, the state. Then yes. you really want to make sure you're staying within the same folder across five years yes. yeah. and not comparing really apples to oranges because it's, it's yeah. different. You don't want to be working with different data sets and compare them, okay? Another thing is when it comes to trends, as of right now, it's, it's, it's hard to look at trends with a five-year estimate because you have so many overlapping years. Even like 2009, 13, the most recent one, it still overlaps a few years uh, with 2005 and 2009. Um, but the next release this December, it's going to be non-overlapping years. It's going to be the 2010, 14. And you can easily um, look at trends comparing to 2509. So moving on, as we release more five-year estimates every December, you're going to be able to be looking at trends and how your community is really changing. Um, with the three years and one year, that's a lot easier to do. Uh, one year, you don't have any overlapping years. You can just look at single years. With the three years, um, there are a few um, of the data sets already released that do not overlap years. So you could look at trends. Uh, with the five years, that's a challenge right now, but it's changing. Next December, we're going to have the first non-overlapping uh, releases, so you can really look at trends. Um, I'm done with the PowerPoint. Um, if we have any questions, I can take questions. Yeah, if you have questions about understanding where this data comes from, how to access it, uh, any things we've been talking about in part one, 862 um, I really love the um, the American Community Survey in that it really gets you down into that really interesting information. Not that the decennial census isn't interesting, but it is very broad and maybe not useful for folks to make decisions. How do you see people using the um, ACS, um, particularly in, in nonprofits? Grants, planning, uh, not only to get the grant, but also planning how you're going to use it for your services. Um, especially because you can look at small geographic levels and there's so much reach data and it's often released. Um, every year you can do an assessment of has it something changed or used for your grant. So um, most of nonprofits I work with, they do use the ACS more often than the census. Well, of course, when we come up with a new census release, like we just did 2010, that year is very important because 100% there, there are no margin of errors. While you have the ACS as a survey, you do have to deal with the margin of errors. Um, so the census is important in that aspect. When it's released, it's very good to reassess the size of your population, the basic characteristics. But then you bring the ACS without that reach information. Um, and I, I think for grants and planning is what I see most often being used for. You mentioned that um, making sure people reference it correctly. Can you talk a little bit more about um, that protocol and, and best practice for folks when they are sharing this data out maybe with their grantees or mm -hmm. their volunteers or the board and making sure they, they cite it. Yeah. Well, uh, the easy way to do is when, every time you d get a table from our website, uh, the title of the table, the table ID, the data sets all there. Just use that information if you can as a reference. Or uh, just refer to the survey. Um, if you are in the narrative, you want to refer to the data. Say, uh, there's 11% of the population here is below poverty. 
according to the 2009-2013 American Community Survey. Having those ears there give the reader an idea of what period you're referring to. It's not just 2013, it's between 2009 and 13 the data was collected. Um, so making reference to the survey name also is important. Not only because you want to make sure you give correct references, but um, we are known to do the census and uh, we want people to get to become familiar with the ACS because we are collecting data and if we knock on the door and you say, well, I'm here to conduct the American Queen Survey. Oh my God, what's that? No, you're the Census Bureau. You only conduct census every 10 years. This is not the Census Bureau, which is not true. So more familiar people get with the ACS by looking at the data or every time you, you apply for a grant, if you write down the American Queen Survey, I think that name is going to become more popular and we can get better responses. We have great response in the ACS. It's uh, our only mandatory survey. Uh, as it is part of the decennial census. So we do get nationally an average of 97% response rate, which is great yeah, from a large incredible. sample. I know. <laughs> but it's an important survey. A great percent of the funding that go for domestic use of allocated um, comes from the ACS data. They use it for programs um, to allocate funding. Um, and again, in the local level, you can use for planning and grants as well. Um, that's why we re really encourage response. So sourcing also helps us get the community to know that it should participate. Well, I want to give folks a chance to call in um, and also take a quick stretch break because we're going to be transitioning now to part two. Yes. We're going to be digging into the data on the website so that you'll be able to see what it looks like when you go in. Um, and we, of course, welcome the questions, um, but we're going to be building off what we just covered. So we've kind of laid the, uh, the building blocks. Alexandra has explained to us our filing cabinet so we know where we're finding our data. Uh, and now we're going to go look at and see actually that process yeah. of... Which this will all make a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Part one definitely makes a lot more sense when you go online. But it's hard to go online without knowing this. Yeah. So we're going to have parches. Absolutely. It's so helpful. It's really making it clearer for me.